All right, let's get started. Good evening, and thanks for tuning in. I'm the Reverend Terry Melvin, president of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists and host of Labor Shift. We're taking a slight detour from our original program we had planned, which intended to look at the effects of the coronavirus from a variety of perspectives, economic, social, and generational. We had titled the show Red, White, Black, and Stressed Out. Well, another more familiar and lethal virus has unleashed an epic wave of stress and anger and rebellion across the nation from Minneapolis to LA, to Brooklyn, from Idaho to Iowa, to Miami, and nearly every black household in America. Racism surfaced last week to choke yet another black life to death. We all watched over and over the sickening cell phone video of a white Minneapolis cop press his knee into the neck of George Floyd. Pressing, even as Floyd uttered the same words that we heard Eric Gardner gasp in 2015. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. For eight long minutes and 46 seconds, another Black man was tortured and murdered in broad daylight in the custody of four police officers. This while COVID-19 is snatching away our jobs and loved ones. This, my sisters and brothers, while we risk our lives in hospitals, delivering the mail and packages, tending to the elderly in nursing homes and hauling garbage. This, while white folks flock to beaches to resume living their American dream. Indeed, the fallout from COVID-19 and the racist policing have formed the perfect storm of trauma to hit our families and communities, which are already reeling from three and a half years of Trumpism. So tonight, we're gonna have a frank family conversation about these twin viruses and how we can respond to the threats they pose to our existence. Now I have an outstanding lineup of guests tonight. We have with us tonight, uh, Bill Spriggs is a chief, chief economist for the AFL-CIO and a longtime friend of CBTU. He is also a distinguished professor in economics, of economics at Howard University in Washington, D.C. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Bill is the author of a best-selling book that a lot of brothers should rush and buy. It's entitled A Man's Guide to surviving divorce, breakups, and women in general. I don't know about that, Bill. Uh, my dear sister, Clayola Brown, is the shoulder I lean on whenever crazy folks start working my nerves. Clay is CBTU's first vice president and the president of the A. Philip Randolph Institute, which has been on fire this spring with a relentless 2020 census work. After a good dose of knowledge from the old school legends, you will hear from guests who call Jay-Z old school. Well, that tells you uh, why they are the perfect guests to talk about how young black folks are navigating the day-to-day -day effects of corona and racial anxiety. The many black, uh, the many Melvin, I should say, is a rising star in the CBTU family. Oh, as we call him is a member of our executive council and chair of our under 40 group. O is also an activist in the St. Louis chapter as well as his own union, CWA. Jada Jenkins Curtis is an APRI activist who taught Clayola TikTok had nothing to do with time or a clock. She is APRI's national youth leader and coordinator. And our final guest is Jessica Oray. She too is an APRI activist who works two jobs with $100,000 in student loan debt and hoping to hit the lottery real soon. So to start us off this evening, uh, Bill, I wanna ask you, uh, black workers and black businesses have taken on a heavy economic hit from the coronavirus and a long lockdown. 
in terms of jobs loss and shrinking income. A lot of folks are barely getting by and they're wondering, where's my lifeline? How does the economic picture look and is real help on the way? Bill, can you help us? Got to unmute, Bill. Thanks so much, Terry. And I don't know how much I can help people with breaking up since uh, I'm on my way to 35th anniversary and I don't know much about that. So, uh, <laughs> so, so, so if I put out the book, don't buy it. I'm gonna run through these slides real quick so we can get to everybody else talking. Uh, as Terry said, we've suffered huge income losses from the job losses that have taken place. This is the latest information we have. 59% of our Hispanic brothers and sisters have lost income. Their households have lost income. 55% of black households have lost labor income. This is important for the recovery of our economy because the total wage bill lost in this nation so far through April runs at the rate of $700 billion sucked out of the economy. Unemployment insurance is going to be important in filling that hole. And you see these bars, they're indicating to you how unemployment insurance is trying to make up for that big gap. Here's the problem. We're not getting the unemployment insurance. Unfortunately, Black workers are located in those states that have been the meanest about getting people unemployment insurance. For Black men, it's a very low rate compared to other men. They're getting about 25% of unemployed. Other men are getting unemployment insurance. It's running far lower for Black men, but here's the tragedy. For Black women, the majority of Black workers are women. Only 6% of unemployed Black women are drawing unemployment insurance, even though, as you can see, we have almost 22% who have applied or tried to apply to get the benefits. This is far lower than for other women. It's hurting our economy. I want to get to the point of loss of life, though, because there's another tragedy that's taking place, and COVID is killing us. It is killing us. And to understand the relationship between work and COVID killing us, this is the age of people who go into the hospital for COVID. If you're Hispanic, if you're one of our Hispanic brothers, almost half are between 18 and 49. That's working age. For Black workers, it's a little more spread out between working age, those who are 18 to 49, plus those who are 50 to 64, that's the majority of black people going to the hospital because of COVID, working age people. For whites, it's because they're old, they're over 65. 65% of whites going to the hospital with COVID are over 65, they're not workers. We have been told too often that we're dying from COVID because of pre-existing conditions about us, about our health, because we have diabetes, because we have high blood pressure, because we have pulmonary uh, 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 blockage of breathing. This is what we're told. But the Center for Disease Control study, 305 people went to the hospital in Georgia, found no significant difference among those people for diabetes, no significant difference for obesity, no significant difference for asthma or other lung uh, ailments. In fact, this is what they found. Of the 305 people went into that hospital, a disproportionate share of those people were Black. 83% were Black, even though we were only 47% of the patients in the hospital altogether. But of those with COVID, Black people were no more likely to die, no more likely to end up on in vitro because they had COVID. We are dying from COVID because we catch COVID, and we're catching COVID because we work. I want you to see this so you can get it a little clearer. This is the share of people who are dying from COVID compared to the people who catch COVID. If you're above this line, it means you're far more likely to die than you are to catch the disease. But look at all these states. This is state-based data in all these states where Black people are less likely to die from COVID than they are to catch COVID. So whether you're in Iowa or if you're in Rhode Island or if you're in Pennsylvania, you're far more likely to catch COVID than you are to die from it. We're not dying because of something we do. We're dying because we're catching it. We're catching it because of what we do. 
healthcare workers, this dark line shows you if you're a healthcare worker, given your race, how likely are you to catch COVID? And you can see that for blacks and whites, that's about the same. We're catching COVID as healthcare workers because we're healthcare workers. The disease does not discriminate. It doesn't pick out a race. If you're at work, you will catch it at work the same. But a disproportionate share of us are healthcare workers. So even though the disease doesn't discriminate against us because we're Black, because we're Black, we're more likely to be healthcare workers and therefore more likely to catch the disease. We're more likely to be child and social service workers. We're more likely to be healthcare workers. We're more likely to be trucking and postal workers. We're more likely to be the bus driver who has passengers sneezing and blowing their nose on them and coughing on them and handing them money that has already touched the virus. We're more likely to be in UFCW as that frontline grocery worker than we are to be in the general population. That's what the white line indicates. Sadly, we are put under so much pressure that many of us feel we have to go to work even if we have symptoms. We are forced to go to work even when we don't feel well. And look at this, this is for women where this is the most acute. Almost 18% of Hispanic women went to work in the previous week, even though they had multiple symptoms that would indicate they might have COVID. For black women, it's close to 15%. We are put in that precarious position that we need to work or face the risk of catching this disease. That's not right. That's how they're killing us with the disease. And then finally, they're killing us by then not even giving us the health insurance. The loss of job means the loss of health insurance. Our Hispanic brothers and sisters now, over 16% of them are back to not having health insurance. This is pre-Affordable Care Act. Obamacare chased the uninsured rate down to very low levels, but here we are back again, facing a world in which we're losing jobs, losing income, and unfortunately, when we go to work, losing our lives. Thank you, Terry, for letting me be a part of this. Thanks, Bill, so much for uh giving us the facts and some hope to hold on to at least. Um, appreciate your uh, words of wisdom. We can always count on you to bring the facts. Uh, next, we want to uh, hear from uh, Clay. Uh, Clay, nearly uh, one third of the 100,000 plus COVID-19 deaths uh, in the US are black folks. But there is another side to this staggering death toll and grief that doesn't get enough attention in the media. Can you talk a, a little bit about some of the underlying social factors uh, and the mounting mental health issues tearing at our families and young people? Clay? Sure. Thanks, Terry, for having me join you tonight on this. And Dr. Spriggs, I heard your entire presentation loud and clear. And many of us have heard the declarations uh, over these last two and a half months from the healthcare professionals that were provided to us by um, the Trump team that talks specifically about our innate ability to be sick or sicker because of who we were and how badly we had treated ourselves. Well, we have been talking more and more now, and people are listening closer and closer because of the disparities within our communities, the kinds of things that are not provided within our own individual communities, we are having less of a chance of surviving this piece uh, because we, like Dr. Spriggs was saying, we got to go to work. There is no trust or no this or no that, no fallback income that will help us to be able to make the logical decision to do the remote work on a lot of cases. Uh, all of the frontline workers are impacted at a rate that is mind blowing. All of the work that we do in large numbers are considered essential jobs. So therefore, when we have to go where the uh, impact of catching the disease is higher, we gonna get something. Now in our communities themselves, we have a whole lot of I ain't gots as well. 
in our communities, we don't have the kind of financial institutions or facilities there that will help us to pull together the kind of resource dollars that will allow us to make the decisions that if we can't get the leave from work, well, we're gonna stay home until it is good for us to, to go out here. We have in our communities the payday lenders, the title lenders, the this kind of lenders, and all the rest of them without a brick and mortar bank to be found. Our accounts are not backed up by an ACH account. Half of our population don't even know what that is. And it's not because we're not smart people. It's just that when we talk to banks, they don't speak to us in the same language as they do everyone else. When we take a look at the food that is there for us, we don't have the kind of food that is readily available. We have food deserts. It's not our choice of diet, it's the desert that's there within our communities where we must do that extra. We've got to check the expiration dates on our stuff and take a good look to make sure that nothing else has been eaten at it before we got it to eat it. When we take a look at all of these kinds of things that are combined to our decision-making process to stay healthy and go to work healthy so that we can survive the, the, the critical information that we've gotten from people like Dr. Spriggs and others that if you go vulnerable, you're gonna be catching it. And the vulnerability comes from our necessity to be at work because we are those essential frontline workers. Now, what does that do to us as we look through all of those? The food desert, the financial desert, the loss of medical insurance, which then creates a health desert for us. What does that do? It messes with your head. And that's not just an old people thing. We get crazy because of age. But for our young people who are really struggling with everything that's happening at one time, Mental health is also an issue that we need to be proactive on in order to take care of our total community. As a people, we don't like to talk about it, but this is something that we have got to address. And if we are going to talk about it, we have to be clear, concise, and unashamed. There is no stigma to needing help to get our heads straight. What we have to do is find the resources and the providers to make that happen for us. So Terry, that's the portion that I wanna put on the table when we open the discussion about what do we do about what COVID is doing to us. Thanks so much, Clay. I, I knew you would bring it home for us, uh, talking about what's really going on in our community. It's one thing to get the stats and the facts. It's another thing to get, bring, it, really bring it home and really talk about what, what's happening uh, or what I should say is not happening in our community. I want to... Uh, here now from our uh, younger guests. Uh, oh, uh, let me ask you this. How do you prepare yourself physically and emotionally to deal with COVID health threats and the threats to your humanity as a young black man in America? How, how do you deal with this? Help us out. Um, well, to, I'll say um, to effectively answer that question, um, I have to use an organizing tactic or strategy that CWA um, trainers teach us, and that's the story of self. And basically, if you can't explain why you fight for the things that you do, no one is really going to believe you. And with that said, um, so before COVID, I had, like many of us, I had family members who have health conditions, um, mental health challenges things like that. So I uh, was immediately started like fighting for, especially after Ferguson, started fighting for um, Medicaid for all, making sure that everyone has um, quality health care and affordable health care. Um, also, um, speaking to my union and being in communication with my union and coworkers holding the employer accountable for protective gear and um, making sure that the right people get administrative leave or sick leave who were affected by the uh, virus. So also speaking out for coworkers. Um, also um, looking into holistic and herbal healing techniques that has worked for us for centuries um, before Western medicine. Um, also, I would say the number one thing is making sure my spirituality is in check. 
Um, and that's building and maintaining an intimate relationship with God, uh, Mother Nature or the universe, uh, what have you. And this provides um, a peace and calm uh, through the storm. Um, and it helps um, clear the mind. And with a clouded mind, you can't really produce effective results. Um, so um, I make sure that I enter spaces, um, I pray um, to make sure that I have a clear head first before doing any kind of work. Um, I make sure that I educate and organize uh, my fellow union members, family, friends, uh, no matter who they are, where they are in organizing or if they are even in the movement at all. Um, Cause we all come in for different reasons at different times. Um, and also um, talking to our allies and uh, making sure that they align with our values and they help and push our agenda um, and not really helping us, like helping us backtrack. Um, to be honest, I really not a fan. I'm really not a fan of politics, uh, but I do make sure that I'm informed enough to know how to move and how I um, how to vote, who I need to vote for, what issues are on the ballot, what issues I need to vote for. Um, and lastly, I will say um, I make sure that I reach out to the youth and young people that's coming behind me. Make sure that I empower them and um, teach them the techniques that I have learned in the movement um, because the fight has to keep going and we, we all not promised tomorrow. So uh, the things I learned, I make sure I teach others and um, also empowering our sisters. Uh, they have been our backbone through all these uh, movements um, and their voices are not are um, drowned out a lot in a patriarchal society that we live in. Um, so making sure that youth and sisters, our sisters' voices are heard to make sure that the fight continues. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, my brother. Thank you, President. The other folks see why you're one of our up and coming leaders at CBTU. Uh, Jada, I wanna turn to you. He uh, lifted up the the black women and women in general when he was uh, talking. Um, uh, so Jada, as a uh, young black woman, how has COVID-19 and the recent police killings, uh, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, and George Flood influenced your activism? Are you more inspired to make change or more pessimistic? Uh, about your generation achieving equality in America? I know me personally, um, this has definitely made a bigger influence than what I thought it would. I never, first, first and foremost, I never thought that I would live in a society where we're seeing riots like we did back in the 60s. Let's get that out of the way right now. Um, I will say it's definitely influenced my activism in a way of I do feel like we need to be a lot more strategic in how we plan on taking back our power. Um, we're in a very we're in a prime time in life. We have technology and so many so many tools at our fingertips. Um, I will say it's it's very scary right now because we have to protect everything that is ours. Learning the the black businesses that are around us to make sure that we don't burn those down or vandalize all of those because we're only taken away from ourselves. But on top of that, what we've also seen in a lot of videos is that a lot of the stuff that's being vandalized isn't done by us. So it's very hard um, to be strategic. I will say that much because, you know, we peaceful protest and, you know, the oppressors get mad, we riot and they get mad. So it's definitely a learning curve. I will say that um, being a youth leader has made me think and it's kept me up late at night trying to think of how to keep my people safe. I have brothers that are upset about these situations and they have every right to be. We are on a land that was not built for us. It was not made for us to prevail in life. And now they're mad that we're trying to take our power back, but we cannot stop because of that. I will say that much. Um, it's gonna take some time and it's definitely gonna take a lot of creative minds to come together at once, mm -hmm. um, to stay in the house and come together 
it's I, I personally do not think it's very smart to go out there because we're only taken away from ourselves. They don't care about us. And that's plain and simple. And it has been brought out in broad daylight. Um, it has, I, I'm very, I'm very optimistic about the future. I will say that much because there's power in numbers. And um, obviously I wasn't there way back when we had our MLKs and our A. Philip Randolphs and stuff like that. But to see the people that are my age to come together and actually stand for something inspires me. And it definitely does make me feel a lot better about it, you know, but I, at the same time, like I said, we have to be very careful with how we move. You know, we have young ones out here that we have to look out for. We have, you know, I know myself, I have a little sister to look out for and it scares the mess out of me that she has to see this kind of stuff, you know? So me personally, I feel like it is my job to think of creative ways to keep our family safe. And that's at the end of the day, what it is. All right, thank you so much, Jada. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. The youth is something else. I'm telling you, y'all gonna keep us on the right track and move us to higher ground. Now we want to uh, take some time and uh, hear from Jessica. Jessica, you're a strong, positive black woman with big dreams and a lot of hustle and a big debt that you need to get out of. Now, how has Trump's war on black people added to your anxiety over the mountain of debt you face. All right, so yes. when when Trump was elected, um, he promised the black community better jobs and education. Jessica, can so, we see your face? No, um, oh. you I work show? for a, no, I work for a company and I cannot reveal the logo, I apologize. Oh, okay, all right, um, go ahead. So that um, when Trump was elected, he promised the black community better jobs and education to struggling cities. But I'm sure a lot of people believed and depended on him to be a man of his word. So however, um, since then, basically over 70% 70, 70 of the African-American community financial situation has declined, if not stayed the same. Unfortunately, well, I'm kind of blessed. Um, my financial situation definitely stayed the same, but the anxiety set in when those loan payments became front not center or behind and where were the jobs promised by the trump administration so since this election um i've worked a part-time job for over four years with no sight of a new career and during that time i was say, well i have already obtained my bachelor's degree um in between that four year um job that i had i pursued my master's um so fast forward i received that degree in december of 19 and here goes Sally Mae again. She was still in view. And so after that, um, getting my master's degree, I was on the hunt for a full-time job. So then that's when the pandemic came. Um, COVID-19 did hinder it. I had to make some adjustments. I couldn't do face-to-face -face like I wanted to do, um, just completely submit online. However, I did end up taking a temporary job in addition to my part-time job. Um, five months post-grad, it transitioned into a full-time position finally. Um, so I am six months post-grad, June 13th, with a full-time job, and I am now able to manage those loan payments and live my best life. So the anxiety did set in when there was really no jobs in sight when the Trump administration promised those. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. That, that, so many people make so many promises, and then when they get elected, what happens? Uh, some of us saw through those promises when he was uh, uh, running for office. So I'd like to uh, thanks Jessica so much for your uh, uh, input. Um, we done covered a lot with everybody given their opening uh, comments and statements based on the questions, but I'd like to, to open it up and really have a conversation, a family conversation. I mean, uh, we are not, none of us are in a situation where we don't know what's going on around us. Uh, at this point in time, uh, we have seen over the last a few days, uh, our community has really erupted. Uh, you have those that are out that are uh, peaceably protesting, and then you have those that are frustrated, as we've heard in this discussion already, uh, just frustrated and don't know how to take their frustration out. And then you've got those that just want to tear things up. Uh, can somebody talk to me about, uh, particularly if we could start with the young folks, uh, what do you guys see 
uh, in what is happening out there over the last few days, what kind of message could we get or how could we shift the paradigm of what's going on out there today? What, what could change uh, what's going on today from your point of view? Um, hi, I see a lot of hurt, a lot of emotion. Um, you have to think about, I guess in our community, the mental health piece, um, we don't really express our emotions the way we need to. Um, I think we need to turn our attention to the polls, which I think is so easy to say, but I think it's just a mental thing. We're expressing, we're tired of talking, we're tired of this, we're tired of that, nobody is hearing us, so we have to take to the street. And to shift that, we all have to mobilize and organize. We got to get out and vote and get these elected officials that are not doing anything for us out, period. Very good, Jessica. Uh, O oh, or Jada, what about, uh, how do we make that happen? I mean, you can tell people to go vote, but how do we, how do we get young folks? I mean, we looked at this uh, uh, voting and, and many of us who deal with this, uh, O oh already said he ain't a fan of politics anyway. He go vote because he have to, not because he want to. Um, how do we get other folks inspired to, even if you don't want to go, you understand it's a necessity that you do go? Um, I know what I have learned uh, throughout my time being in the A. Philip Randolph Institute. I've learned that it starts at your local elections. Uh, we all know plain as day that we don't get the um, education that we need in our school systems on our own cultures. With that being said, we need to be teaching it to our kids within our houses. Um, knowledge is power and that's a very cliche thing to say, but that's something that I've really learned the value of within the past, I'll say maybe two years, I think. That's probably when I truly learned the value of that and even started deep diving into my own culture myself. Um, kind of like, oh, before, before I started working with APRI, I was not into politics and did not even see a future involving politics whatsoever but being that is such that it is such a um demand especially being a black woman understanding the politics is the least that i can do to help do my community justice understanding that the local elections are and can help you know mold and shape the national elections is the most important part um and i i don't think that that's stressed enough i mean i know we hear it all the time at the rallies because we're the ones putting the rallies on but the people that are at these rallies might not hear it as much as we may say it because it's a different crowd every time. It starts in your own household and it starts very young in my opinion. Instilling our own knowledge and instilling these, these wonderful black people and everything that they have done for us at a very young age is where it starts. All right, oh, thank you. Oh? Um, I would say um, one thing I use, and it's very simple, and this um, hit them with the truth. Um, a lot of people don't like that, but when you um, have facts to back you up, um, a lot of people can't really come back um, to counter those. Um, just like, for one, starting off with our history, um, letting people know the sacrifices that our people had to go through um, just to even vote um like having to know the presidents backwards or different um taking literacy tests that they know the answers weren't on the test um just starting there and then um like recently i found out here in missouri like the governor cut the budget from education and but he's funding the department of corrections um and that's like the the root of our problem is our taxpayer dollars is just being spent like it's free money and at the um, expense of our own lives. And But these people, they just put the money wherever they see fit. And I feel like that's just too easy for them. Um, and the only way to uh, combat that is to vote simply. And like um, my sister Jada was saying, um, your local and state elections are crucial in this because they're the ones that have to sign off on these budgets. Mm -hmm. And you have a say so in where this money goes. This is your money. This is your hard earned tax money that they take out your check every week <laughs> or every other week. You have a say so where that money goes. And um, 
going to the Department of Corrections or building prisons or um, all these things, you got to um, realize that the same money can go towards building new schools. The same money can go towards mental health initiatives. The same money can go towards um, social workers in schools and in people's workplaces and even just in the neighborhood um, to help us deal with the trauma that we're living in. Um, and uh, reaching as far as reaching out to young people, you just have to meet them where they are. Um, me organizing um, young younger people than I am, I realize they're not even into the same stuff that I'm into. So it's just um, tapping into what grabs their attention, whether it's TikTok, whether it's um, Snapchat, or whatever um, venue or avenue that they use now, um, and it's, it's um, collecting their voices. Um, ask them how they want to be heard, because it's not up to us to force it on them. Oh, you must do this this way. No, ask them, how can we effectively reach out to you? Where um, you have youth 18 and older uh, registered to vote, um, having making it cool to vote, because right now that's it's not a thing. And a lot of mm -hmm. us are distracted with other things where uh, voting just doesn't seem cool when at the end of the day, our livelihoods really depend on it. And just stressing that importance um, and getting that message broken down to young people, I think would be uh, very crucial, especially with this election coming up. Thanks so much. I oh, appreciate it. Um, I wanna turn, if I could, to Bill uh, Spriggs. Bill, we uh, come to you, uh, your CBTU family, your labor family, we always come to you uh, for facts and figures. Bill, you tell us what's going on uh, with the economy and make this make, this make sense to us as Black folks. And I, I want you to look at this and I want to ask this question from a different point of view. Uh, you're a Black man of a certain age and you have lived through a lot uh, in this country. Uh, you've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. Given what we are going through right now, and 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 uh, with the economy, uh, with the state of play, with the attack on the black community, uh, how do we get out of this? I mean, from your point of view, I mean, you've seen some stuff happen. I mean, what what do you, what do you think? Give us some wisdom. Uh, well, my first thing is pray. <laughs> because uh, it's going to take prayer. If, if you understand the economics plight that we're in, it's complicated because this isn't the normal downturn. Normally, the Federal Reserve or somebody in finance is messed up. This time we had a disease and it's created huge uncertainty. And on top of that, you have a leader who creates uncertainty. And those are things that mess up the economy. It can't function with uncertainty. People don't know, will I have a job next month? Uh, will I be able to pay my bills next week? These levels of uncertainty mean they're not buying cars, they're not buying homes, and our economy needs that to go forward. Um, if we don't change the man who's in the White House, um, I, I don't see it correcting itself. I don't see this, the, the fix isn't from the Federal Reserve doing the right thing. The fix is from our leadership controlling the disease, understanding it's a threat to all human life, and convincing us that they have a plan that will keep it under control, and to care enough about people to worry that we're going to hit the fall with state and local governments with less money, the inability to open our schools and have them function the way they should. So this election is, is beyond anything I've, I've ever experienced in terms of being important for the survival of the nation. Um, it is that, that is different. Uh, and my, my, my fear is compounded because this is the highest unemployment rate white men have ever had, and they have not turned on him. 
And the fact that he can keep that base despite having this high unemployment rate means that this election isn't about the economy or anything we've had elections about before. This election is truly and honestly about democracy with a little d and where and will it survive so that that's uh that's my take thanks thanks so much uh phil appreciate it uh and now i want i need to go to clayola uh as i said in my opening clay is the one that i rely on when i was getting ready to go completely off uh she is the one that can usually calm me down in the room and uh folks have come to know that they kind of stage clay close to me when we're in meetings together to make sure that i maintain my calm particularly if somebody's going to say something crazy, which they tend to. But Clay, you've been uh, in the movement for a few years. Uh, you have held uh, different positions within your own union, high level positions, vice president positions. You served uh, for many years as a vice president of the national AFL-CIO. Uh, as a black woman in the movement, uh, given where we are right now, what do you see uh, that we as a movement and we as black folks in the movement uh, need to be doing at this point in our history. With all the stuff you laid out, you laid out, we got deserts all over the place. Uh, Bill talked about we the essential workers. Uh, young folks done talked about the issues that's going on. What, what do you see? Well, I'm glad you asked me, Terry, because one thing I learned from Jada and Jessica and you know all of our young people, and even my granddaughter, is that for older people, we use too many words. With getting to where we need to be, we need to cut down the rhetoric and get busy. I see the young people laughing. Yeah, y'all be trying to tell us to shut up. We gonna get it out one way or the <laughs> other, okay? But I think it's real clear, especially now, what is at the root of most of this stuff that's going on and it's pure and simple racism people can't get past their prejudice no matter how badly they are impacted themselves they hang on to that bit of racist separatism that seems to make them comfortable and when we take a look at which states are really out there and crazy because both of our young people that are on the screen and Jessica as well said a big part of what we have to do is to make the real changes in the leadership in this country. I have never seen a bigger racist than the man who likes to call himself I as president ever speaking for the people of this country. It's scary. I would not want to be your 20 or 30 or 40 or even 50 year old these days. It is something that will keep you up late at night. It's something that makes you wonder, where is my time? At that age, you have dreams and aspirations. But what is so refreshing is the willingness on behalf of the young folk that we're watching right now to get in and engage in the fight. They're staying focused. They're not falling for the okie doke of the two-step that a Trump does to dissuade you from staying on course and making sure that you stay focused on this upcoming election. They're sticking with it. They are talking about all of the craziness that's going on, but they are also staying prepared and laser focused on what has to happen in November. We can't dance to every silly behind move he makes, but what we can do is what we know will work. Do the education that Jada talked about, Say the things that O was talking about that's real to people, young folk. Do what Jessica is talking about. Remind folks who are young that even though they did everything that we asked them to do, the prize is a little farther out there for the reality that they face. And keep pushing us old folks to do the things that we do best and reminding us that we have to step aside every now and then and follow your lead. So yeah, it's tough and it's a lot of stuff to do, but too many words and staying focused are the lessons that I've learned from y'all. And yeah, Terry, I thought TikTok was a tic tac that you put in your mouth. <laughs> then they taught me the brief message style of a tic tac, being able to deliver the messages in short order in a funny way. I am just so excited 
about the leadership that's coming along today, that I can sit back in this chair and take me a good position and know that if I'm patient and listen, our young people will show us how to handle the problems that are in front of us. Our job is to be supportive and fight for them, not against them in becoming the new leaders in this movement and in our country. Thank you so much, Clay. You know, one of the, um, uh, we look and seeing with all the riots and, and the protests that are going on, the main issue is our failed criminal justice system, or as Jada put it, a criminal justice system that was not made for us to succeed in, right? So uh, when we look at the system the way it is, uh, what suggestions um, do any of you have, and I don't want to put this on anyone in particular, but what, what suggestions that any of you have that we should be looking for uh, come January 2021? What type of things should we be pushing to have change with a new, or even a current, well, I can't say that, with a new administration uh, in the White House? What, what are the top things that you folks that are on today think that we need to be looking at? Everybody don't speak at the same time. <laughs> um, well, I would like to see, to be honest, a national um, police brutality or uh, racism, anti-racism uh, legislation uh, drafted. Um, one thing, we have been dealing with this um, thing of police brutality ever since uh, the reconstruction uh, with the patty rollers coming through and just hanging us and stuff. And I feel like uh, legislation should have been in place. It, sh it shouldn't be just, um, this shouldn't be something that we just embarking on, upon. Um, and it's like they, the system knows what it's doing. And the only way is that people can, these cops, these killer cops can be held accountable. Uh, we need a nationwide uh, legislation with, uh, actual power behind it of how these um, cops and racists are handled as far as um, justice goes. So that's what I would say. All right. Anyone else want to bite? I personally feel like um... I personally feel like another way to help our own community is to keep us in our own communities. Um, that's how I personally feel. I've noticed that like, you know, unfortunately, but it's inevitable, you know, a lot of the celebrities that are out nowadays, they have a heavy influence on our younger influence. I mean, on our younger um, generation, I'm sorry. But nonetheless, you know, it's not always the best influence. Um, I feel like there's there's so much that the black community can offer and so much that we do offer so much that even the oppressors thrive off of you know if at the end of the day once they realize that they're going to need us more than we need them once we come together they're going to be the ones that have an issue on their hands not us I feel like that's why I was saying earlier, you know, it really just depends on strategic planning. Um, and, you know, obviously this isn't gonna be solved overnight, um, but it is definitely something that is continuously a work in progress. Cause I will say, even with the whole TikTok thing, um, I find as I scroll through that app and I'm truly contemplating, well, not even contemplating, I will more than likely delete that app only because it's like, I see a lot of people, a lot of big, big voices that are black on that app that speak out about these issues, but the app continues to delete the videos that are bringing awareness to our communities. So that's why we need to bring our own money into our, you know, back into our communities. We need to make a, a black version of TikTok, you know, and, you know, just stuff that that's, that's more within us, stuff built for us, really truly for us all right all right thanks bill um jada brought up something about uh money in our community uh can you just share with us uh how long do we keep a dollar in our community versus other folks well uh I, what i'm concerned about right now at this moment is our communities by having this big drain our labor income has collapsed. 
we we don't have the liquidity and the response in the black and hispanic community when we get frightened is to save 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 so our consumption plummets the big problem for for our community that means that when when there's a downturn the businesses in our communities get hit extra hard because we withdraw really fast and at at, at the rate we're going uh, that challenges how do you keep businesses going in our community that can reemploy us and hopefully coming out of this we'll, we'll get some more vision about um, businesses that we can create that can sustain this that can sustain downturns that can sustain the fear that we get a lot of us are feeling the other shoes about to fall you know, so far the unemployment rate went up so much more for white people than for us. That's because that first wave of job loss was in the places where they were, not where we were. And I think uh, it's it, it, it's scary to understand, you know, what happens when it comes our way because we know that this recession is just starting. So that's what I'm worried about. All right. All right. Let me um, let me ask another question. When, uh, clearly, over the last two election cycles, uh, it has been uh, black women that have come through uh, and brought us through to victory, uh, where we've had victories. And um, there is a growing concern um, amongst many of us uh, by what we've seen that not necessarily black women, but black men. Um, are being courted by the other side, number one, uh, and either being courted to go that way or to just stay home. Now, when it comes to our health, let me just try to frame this. When it comes to black men health, we don't take care of ourselves, but our women make sure we get to the doctor and our women make sure we go get checked up and they make sure we take our medicine when we are supposed to take our medicine. Now for, and I frame it this way because I wanna ask this question. How do we get, and this is for the men and the women because y'all gotta help us when we can't get there. How do we get black men to the polls this November to vote? How do we do that? This is for the, this is for the black women that's on here and this is for the black men that's on here. Cause we looked at y'all to get us where we need to go. So men, what do you think? And women, what do you think? I was trying to be quiet to give Jessica a chance to, to speak up, but Jessica, get ready. Cause after I say this, I wanna hear what you think too. I wanna to digress just for a second, Terry, if you don't mind. Um, when you were asking the earlier question about what do you see moving forward? And O said about the um, police piece, I don't want us to lose that because there's clearly, there are clearly two different kinds of responses from the police force when it comes to all the stuff that's going on. And I will get to how we push you men to what you need to do, okay? Uh, <laughs> Keep it clean. <laughs> I, I do recognize, and I think it's Judith Brown, Diana said, said it when I heard it the first time, that when it comes to law enforcement, a good deal of what we see from the police is that when it comes to white folks, they do to protect and serve. That's how they treat their community. But when it comes to black communities, they do law and order. They pull out the law and they order us to whether we go into jail, penitentiary, or wherever, or to heaven. And I don't think that that piece should be lost and oh, I'm glad you said it, that we have got to take a real strong stance when it comes to the penal system in this country and those that are supposed to be there to protect us as well. We pay their salaries, just like everyone else who pays taxes. And we have not got the luxury of just assuming that that blue wall or blue shield or whatever they wanna call it is gonna be there forever. You guys, around the country, and I'm talking about young people, are making a fuss right now that brings that front and center 
and calling them out. Where we were taught the civil disobedience, you know, where we did not attack or go straight forward, but we're seeing how this stuff is working to the point where we got chiefs of police is kneeling in the middle of a crowd and they ain't the same color as us when they kneel down. Now that takes some courage to do, all right? But it is a force that's happening that we have not seen before. But we, on the other hand, as women, when it comes to getting our men to move forward, we've got to stay vigilant with our men when it comes to voting, because with all that impacts our community, the strength of the community has always been a shared partnership. Even though people will tell us that, oh, it's the women who are doing this, or it's the men that won't do that. We get it in our own community that until we become a unit, it's not gonna work to our benefit. We have got to become partners in this thing called survival for our ethnicity, for our culture, and for our own well-being and wealth. So that's what I see, Terry. If we go into the poll, come on, baby, go with me. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't feel well, take this medicine. I'm gonna bust you upside your head because you're going to work tomorrow. Whatever it takes, we've got to be supportive of each other to make things happen. But I did not want the point that you made, O, to get lost out in the wind because it is a good point. It is something that's very vital to our existence moving forward. Excellent. Thank you so much, Clay. Jessica, you want to weigh in? Hey, yes. Um, I think you mentioned something about what do we want to see in the criminal justice system. Am I correct? Yeah. Moving forward in 2021. So previously mm -hmm. in my past life, I had a chance to um, <laughs> work in the criminal justice system and actually get an inside feel of what it's actually like um, versus being on the outside. Again, I'm protecting the agencies that I work for. Um, but on the inside, it's just like the outside. It's a political thing. Um, moving forward, 2021, we have to keep politics out of the criminal justice system. We have to give everybody fair trials. We have to um, go be thorough with the reviews of cases. Um, it's a number of cases I came across that dealt with um, drug usage and women in the correctional facilities um, where we, I, I know personally, uh, one of my mom's friends was just released. And I think one of the small portions of her case was one of the cops planted some drugs, um, basically a setup, just, just set them up. So I think moving forward with the criminal justice system, we have to have people that are accountable and fair. Um, fair is the key word. We don't need anyone who's going to divert because of this particular skin color or move forward because of that, or I know her family, or I know his family. We need people that will hold everybody accountable with the same caliber of fair trial. Um, we need good prosecutors, good judges, black judges, um, more, um, looking at cases now, more civil rights attorneys um, to handle the things that's going on within the criminal justice system. So definitely it's a protect and serve um, for them, but for us, it's law and order. Everything you see now with the batons, to, to me, that's a repeat of what it was back in the day. So moving forward, we need fair treatment. Um, a child shouldn't be sitting in front of an officer or an officer shouldn't be in front of a child. Dogs, pepper spray, no kids should have milk poured on their eyes. It, moving forward, just fair trial. We need the right people. Um, to fix this criminal justice system. Hold these people accountable. If you're an officer, no, you don't need to be segregated. You need to be in general population with everybody else because you knew exactly what you're doing and your badge does not mean anything once you do a crime. All right, all right. Thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you so much. Uh, let me, uh, they sent me signals that it's time to start wrapping up. But uh, let me just say, you brought up the issue of the criminal justice system. We brought that up as an issue to talk about. There's two things that I just want to touch on before we um, go to close here today. Um, one is that the court system uh, is what holds the rules and tells us what we can do and can't do. Uh, let me just say today that if we uh, don't change who's in the White House, we may lose the Supreme Court by a seven to two majority that we will never get back in uh, our lifetime, our children or grandchildren's lifetime. That's important. 
the number of people that this administration has placed on the uh, Supreme, uh, on the federal bench right now is astronomical. Unqualified judges that have been placed on the bench just because they can do it. That is a problem for our community. That's one. Two is we recognize in CBTU that there are a plethora of good cops out there that are, that are protecting and serving the community and doing the right thing. We've seen it in these protests. We've seen it as Clay brought up uh, in uh, protests where you have police praying with people, where you have police kneeling with people, where you have police walking with uh, the protesters in line when they're not on duty. We see this, but it is those few bad apples that we have to figure out, that society has to figure out how to get rid of them. Nobody that's a white supremacist should be on a police force. It, should, it just should not happen. And that's the kind of things that we need to get to, to deal with as we go forward. So in closing, let me, let me thank my guests. I mean, we had a, a spectacular discussion today. Uh, Bill Sprakes, we thank you so much for being here with us. You've been a longtime friend, Clayola. Uh, you, you've been there for me. You continue, will be there. Uh, the many, you are up and coming. Jada and Jessica, we looking for great things out of you uh, going forward. You have shown today why labor shift is necessary in this moment in time. My, my heart goes out to the families of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey, uh, George Floyd, and all families who have lost a son or a daughter at the hand of racism wearing a badge or stroking hate. I can't even imagine how grief stricken I would be if uh, I had to bury one of my children because a police officer had kept his knee on my child's neck for nearly nine minutes. The Lord would just have to forgive me for the kind of justice uh, that I would wish for the tormentor of my child. Uh, I see George Floyd as more than the latest casualty of racist policy. He has become the symbol of the inequality and subjugation of millions of black people who have built this country for centuries. But his humanity cannot and will not be snuffed out by a hateful knee. CBTU is joining uh, the call made by the NAACP to ask the United Nations to intervene and classify the mistreatment of Black people in America by the police as a human rights violation. We also support the call for sweeping federal legislation with teeth to hold police officers accountable to the citizens that they are here to protect and serve. Once the energy and fury of the protests subside, we must still hold police departments accountable for the role in, for, in filling our jails, prisons, and de detention centers with black and brown bodies, for turning a blind eye to domestic violence, for falsifying evidence against innocent, innocent people. We must, and we will. I look forward to seeing you again on June 16th for our next episode of Labor Shift, the best 60 minutes on the clock. To close our show today, I wanna to share a powerful video that I believe expresses the deep, deep plea to recognize our humanity instead of demonizing our beautiful black skin. Thank you for joining us. Let's look at the video.
Father to a black man. 